Right, we are back with yet another gravel bike conversion, and this one is going to be quite the adventure. I'll get onto why in a moment, but for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. For those who have seen my previous gravel bike build, which if you haven't, I'll link it up here somewhere, you'll probably be thinking, why does he need another gravel bike? And that is a very good question. However, there's no point in having a gravel bike for yourself if the person that you most go riding with doesn't have one. You end up just gravel riding on your own. And that, let me tell you, is no fun. Well, it's a little bit of fun, just not as much fun. You get what I mean. So this bike is actually gonna be a conversion that I'm building for my buddy Jimmy, who I always go riding with, so we can both get out and have some proper dirty fun. Yeah, I just said that out loud, didn't I? Anyway, let's look at the bike. Now the bike itself is a professional Blackjack 15 speed, and I would say it's from about the mid 90s. But to be honest, I know very little more about this bike other than it's a pretty budget low end offering. Now professional are still running in the UK, but again, they are at the lower end of the budget market. However, that doesn't mean that this isn't gonna be a fantastic frame for a gravel conversion. Now it's made of steel, it's a good mid 90s steel frame. Uh, there are a few little bits of rust on it, which are gonna need to, to be looked at, but nothing insurmountable. It's mainly all surface rust, so it shouldn't cause me too many problems. Now it's running a three by five gearing setup. Uh, I, I do know that it's running Shimano because it has Shimano index system written on the chainstay here. However, this is so budget, I don't know exactly what group set it has on it because either the sticker has come off of the rear derailleur here, or it never had one. There's nothing on the front derailleur either other than to say Shimano. However, having done a little bit of research, I believe that this rear derailleur is an old RD-TY15 derailleur, but that doesn't really matter to be honest because I'm actually getting rid of the rear derailleur on this because I am changing this from a five speed at the back to an eight speed. Now, I've already measured the rear dropouts because that can sometimes cause issues when you're increasing the amount of gears uh, because the dropouts may need to be spread out a bit. Now with steel frames like this, that isn't an issue because you can cold set the frame to bring the rear triangle out further to accommodate the wider hub that's needed for the greater amount of gears. However, I've already had the wheel off of this and measured the dropouts and they're already at 135 millimeters, which is exactly what I need for the eight speed cassette going on there. So thankfully I won't need to cold set the rear triangle, which is one job that I'm very happy to avoid to be quite honest. Now I got this bike for free on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, someone was just throwing it out and to be honest I'm not that surprised although it is I think a fantastic frame I love this black with the uh, with the turquoise decals but it's clear that this thing has had a life all the spokes are rusty the wheel rims are rusty the cables the seat post here the quill steerer and stem it's all just a little bit tired and old. But as I say, I'm gonna be taking various parts off of this and replacing them with not necessarily new parts, but newer possibly, because I actually have another bike that I found for free, someone was giving away a little while ago, which is going to be like the donor bike for this one. So I'm gonna be taking various bits and pieces off of that to fit onto this bike. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm trying to keep this conversion to as minimal cost as possible. And that leads me on to a very important point about this conversion. Because I know there's often criticism of a large cycling related channel here on YouTube and they do their budget builds that they tend to find things around the office. And the thing is, if you're new to cycling, you won't necessarily have bits and pieces around that you can then bring together to build a full bike with. However, I think as you'll see from this build, it is possible to get cheap or even free parts from other bikes that you can pick up from elsewhere. They won't be the latest and greatest wireless shifting or hydraulic discs or anything like that, but you can still find parts that are perfectly serviceable to give you a proper decent bike. Now, when I first picked up this bike, uh, it's clear that it hadn't been ridden for a while. Uh, the tires were completely deflated. The chain was and still is in a pretty sorry state. So before spending any money on it, I wanted some form of proof of life uh, just to see that this was still a usable frame and that I could build it up into something better than its current state. So I pumped the tires up uh, and they held air, believe it or not. They, they didn't look like they'd been pumped up for a good number of years, but they held air, which was a good start. And then I took it out for a test ride. And let me tell you, for a 30 year old bike that's clearly been well used over the years, this thing rides absolutely fantastically. The brakes are still really sharp, uh, the index gears work really well, and again, despite the fact that there's loads of 
crap and uh, years of build up on the chain and the, the cassettes and the front crank set, it runs really well and I was really, really impressed with it. So I'm really looking forward to actually getting this thing built up to see what it's like with a bit more of a modern setup on it. Now, as the title of this video suggests, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to keep the costs down as much as possible for this build. And so I've looked around the bike, all the things that I need to either repair or replace, and all the parts that I've bought for it that I think that I need come to just under 150 quid at the moment. Now, I'll go through full costings at the end of the video, uh, and the reason for that is that there may be things that crop up along the way while I'm building this uh, that dictate that I need to buy something else. So I don't want to go through full costings just yet and give you a false idea of how much this is going to cost. I want to get the build done first and then at the end of the video I'll explain exactly what I've spent. But as I say, I'm hoping to keep this around the £150 mark to keep it a real budget conversion. Now, as I mentioned right at the very top of this video, this is going to be an adventure build because it's fair to say that there's quite a lot that needs changing on this bike. In fairness to the bike though, as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't the highest spec model uh, even in its heyday, so converting it now won't be without its challenges. Uh, first and foremost, it has this old school style threaded fork uh, with a quill steerer and integrated stem. I need to get rid of the steerer and stem because I need to put an A-head adapter in there to put a more modern stem on to then put the drop bars on. The biggest thing is that this also has an American style BMX bottom bracket shell, uh, which is absolutely huge. So I'm gonna need to remove the one piece crank that's here at the moment, which I'll probably end up doing a completely separate video on uh, because that's gonna be a job just in itself. So I'm gonna have to remove the one piece crank that's in there at the moment and fit an adapter uh, so that I can put a more modern uh, bottom bracket, like a BSA, probably square taper bottom bracket I'm gonna put in there. That needs changing as well. And that's before we even get on to changing the rear derailleur and changing the uh, cassette at the back. In fact, changing the entire wheel. I'm gonna be using that donor bike that I've got outside, which was eight speed itself. Rather than messing around with the hub, I'm just gonna change the wheel completely. Uh, but as I say, the rear triangle has enough space to fit that, so that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Now in preparation for uh, this build, I actually posted in a few cycling forums asking for tips and advice on any pitfalls that I might come across uh, in converting a bike of this age, just to try and get ahead of the curve somewhat so that I wasn't suddenly taking bits off and then having to order stuff and waiting weeks for it to arrive. But let me tell you, asking that question in these forums, the level of vitriol I got for even suggesting that this was a worthwhile frame to try and convert into a modern gravel bike was crazy. Everyone telling me that it was a junk bike, wasn't worth throwing any money at, uh, and that I must be crazy for even considering trying to convert this into anything. However, if there's one thing I teach my kids, it's this. If anyone ever tells you that you can't achieve something you want to do, do it twice and take pictures or in this case, a video. Uh, so I am determined to turn this into something spectacular. However, that quote may come back to haunt me in the end because who knows how this is gonna end up. I don't know at this stage whether I am gonna be able to convert this into a proper gravel bike, but we're all learning together here and I'm hoping, hoping that this should be absolutely awesome when it's finished. Right, so that's enough talk. Let's get on with some action and start stripping the bike down. So as with the last gravel build, the first problem that I come across is the steerer tube. It's currently stuck even though I have released the bolt here. And so let me just show you quickly exactly how this setup works and then from that hopefully we'll be able to devise a plan to get this unstuck. Okay, so now this is the A-head adapter that I've bought to replace the old quill style uh, steerer here. And so you can probably just about make out there is a the top of a long bolt that effectively goes all the way down through the steerer and connects to this part at the bottom that is cut at an angle to the rest of the steerer. Now essentially what happens is that as you screw the bolt in, it pulls this part up and it slides against the upper part of the steerer and it essentially enlarges itself and 
pushes, compresses itself against the inside of the threaded fork. And so now what I think has happened is, despite the fact that I've undone this bolt, either a rust or some kind of galvanic corrosion process is essentially welded to the bottom part of the steerer. So what I'm hoping I can do now is that if I give the top of this nut a whack, what it should do is release then that slanted part from the bottom of the steerer and that should then allow me to pull it out. Fingers crossed that works. If it doesn't, I might have to go back to the drawing board. Yes, right, that seems to have done it, he says. There we go. Oh gosh, yeah, that is full of rust, uh, which is not surprising because that's probably not been moved, changed or touched since the bike was first built about 30 years ago. But that is now out, that leaves the uh, threaded forks intact. And now I've got that out, eventually when I come to replace it, I can put my uh, A-head adapter in and that will then allow me to fit a modern style stem uh, with some drop bars. And so now that's done, the only thing left to do is to take the front and rear brakes off and remove the seat and seat post. Again, the seat post is looking particularly rusty, so I'm hoping that doesn't cause me any problems, but let's see. Oh, wonders never cease. The seat post is twisting, but will it come out? Oh, it's out, there it is. And what's amazing is uh, despite the fact that this is 30 years old and it's probably been stuck in there and all sorts of water and mud and other rubbish has dripped down that seat tube, the chrome is still in remarkably good condition. Uh, that, so that is quite surprising. But ultimately the most important thing is that the frame is now completely stripped. I do still need to take the forks off because uh, I will want to change the bearings in there. Although to be honest, it feels and sounds a little bit gritty, but actually, again, considering the age of the bike, those bearings seem pretty good. But as I say, I will still take it apart, clean it all out, re-grease the bearings and put that back together before installing the new A-head adapter. But for now, I think it's time to give it a good clean down and then assess fully the extent of the rust because now I've taken a few more of these bits off, I can see that there is a little bit more rust on this than I initially saw. But I have actually got a plan for the rust because I've bought a product called Hammerite Currust, which apparently transforms rust to a stable surface in 15 minutes. Uh, and from what I've seen online, it turns all of the brown rusty patches black, ready to be uh, coated or treated. So I'll give this a go, see how this works once I've washed it all down, and then make a decision on exactly what I'm gonna be doing with the paintwork. However, I'm currently in two minds as to what to do with this because as with my last build, I had it completely sandblasted down and then re-powder coated. But that does cost a hundred pounds and there's two things with that. One is that, as I've already said, I'm trying to keep costs down as much as possible with this and adding an extra hundred pounds to the budget just isn't gonna work. And two, I actually really like these decals. And yes, there's a little bit of cracking and a little bit of, I think they call it in the trade, patina to them. But I just think that adds to the character of the bike and I really like that. So for now at least, I think I'm going to leave the stickers as they are. Just give it a good wash down and see how that brings it up. And actually what I might use uh, is a little bit of tea cut as well to try and bring back some of the gloss on the paintwork, which is a tip I got from Craig on Second Life Bikes uh, YouTube channel. If you haven't seen Craig's channel before, it's absolutely awesome. He's got some fantastic uh, renovation jobs and rebuilds of old bikes, and they go from complete junkers to looking like works of art. So if you haven't seen Craig's channel, uh, it's Second Life Bikes, but I'll link it down below in the description. Definitely go and give him a look. But for now, I'm gonna take the forks off and then get this outside and give it a good soapy washdown. So before giving the frame a wash down, I decided to sand out the inside of the steerer tube just to get rid of any old rust that might stop the uh, new A-head adapter gripping properly. I may have gone at it a bit too hard though because, well, just look at it smoking. Once I'd given it a good wash though, I could really see what I was working with in terms of rust and there were some pretty decent patches of it. Luckily most of it seemed pretty cosmetic though, so no structural issues to worry about and I was able to start using a bit of T-cut to take out most of the minor scratches and bring back some of that shine. 
Although it's not perfect, I have to say I was pretty pleased with how it came out. Oh boy, it is a warm one out there. However, I have now fully teacut the bike and it has brought it up really nicely. Now, there's still a few uh, big scratches and rust parts on the top tube and a couple on the, on the steerer tube here and maybe even on the rear triangle that T-Cut is never gonna get rid of. However, for the rest of the tube, it's made it really, really nice and glossy uh, and really shiny, so I'm really happy with that. So the next thing that I need to do, as I say, there's still uh, a few bits of rust on here, so I'm gonna get that Hammerite Cure Rust stuff going, uh, get that on the bike, and hopefully, in a couple of hours, that should turn it a nice black color. It should then just match in with the frame anyway, and I probably wouldn't need to do much to it after that, however, uh, just to make sure that uh, the rust doesn't start coming through again. I will eventually put some kind of clear coat over the top of that or maybe even a bit of clear nail varnish uh, just to stop the rust coming back again. Right, before we get started on putting this cure rust on, um, I've just read on the instructions that it says to uh, work it in well to the rusted areas but try to avoid painted areas. That might be a bit difficult on this, however, to try and do that as much as possible, I'm going to use a very, very fine brush just to try and just the merest tickle uh, onto the rust and see how that works out. If it doesn't look like I'm able to get enough on with this smaller paintbrush, I have actually got a slightly larger one uh, to see how that works out. But let's start getting this on and um, see how it works. didn't take long at all uh, and as you probably saw it was extremely difficult to keep it off of the painted surface because it is very very fluid so it will just drip there's nothing really you can do about that but I've tried to clean it up as much as possible just to keep it to the rusted sections uh, the instructions say to leave it for about an hour or so and it will turn like a bluey blacky color and eventually completely black uh, and then you'll see that it's eaten up all of the rust and the rust will turn black as well so while that's cooking uh, I'm going to go to work on another rusty item being this seat post. Now the saddle itself I'm getting rid of, uh, but the seat post I'll probably use because there doesn't seem to be much at all wrong with it uh, and the new saddle will fit perfectly. Um, however, there is this extreme amount of rust at the top here, but for this, rather than using the Hammerite Cure Rust, I've used a product before which is more like a soaking agent uh, called Evaporust. Unfortunately though, the label on the front of the tub is completely disintegrated and it's gone, so you can't even see what the product is. But yeah, it works really well. I've used it on rusted items before. You leave it soaking uh, in the solution in a sealed bag for a couple of hours and it completely eats up all the rust. You are generally left, depending on how uh, bad the rust is, you might end up with a few pitting marks uh, on the metal, but generally it will eat all of the rust up. So I'm gonna get this useless old gel padded saddle off and go and soak the seat post in some evaporust and come back in a couple of hours to see how the uh, cure rust has gone. Many hours later. Okay, full disclosure, it's been a bit more than a few hours because while I was waiting for the cure rust to go off, and while I was soaking the seat post in Evaporust, I ended up getting sidetracked with some family stuff and never made it back into the garage yesterday evening. But the Cure Rust has now fully gone off and honestly, I'm really, really impressed with how it looks. I did a few close-ups with the camera earlier to try and pick it up, but honestly, you can barely even see where the rust was now. So yeah, really impressed with how that's come out. And also, the seat post. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can see some of the pitting where the rust was, but it is now completely devoid of rust. And again, really impressed with how that's come out. So there's no need to go out and buy another one of these, spend precious money on buying a new seat post, uh, because we can just use this one. The new saddle will fit right onto this. So we've saved ourselves a couple of quid there. So now that that's all stripped down, cleaned, and the rust has been dealt with, it's now time for the fantastic job of building the bike back up again. And I'm gonna start with the fork. Now, I have completely cleaned uh, the old bearings down and they still seem perfect, to be honest. So I'm gonna reuse those, put a load of grease in there. And then once that's in, I can put the A-head adapter in and then put the drop bars on.
Right, so the forks and handlebars are on and they are moving really nice and smoothly. So I'm really pleased with just how the bearings have cleaned up and been re-greased. That is silky smooth. So now moving on to the bottom bracket and considering that this has come out of an old Junker bike that I got for free, it's actually cleaned up and is in remarkably good condition. I've done a previous video on how to service these old BSA style bottom brackets, but actually the bearings in this are also silky smooth. So I don't need to worry about doing that. If you do wanna watch that video though on how to service these bottom brackets, then I'll leave a link up in the corner and also I've done a video on how to convert this really big American BMX bottom bracket to a more standard BSA style. And I'll also link that video up there if you want to go and watch that. But for now, I'm gonna get the bottom bracket in. Now, when you're installing a bottom bracket, the general rule of thumb is that both sides will rotate towards the back of the bike. That's not always the case. There are some European style bottom brackets that turn uh, in a different direction. But for a square taper BSA bottom bracket, you will always usually turn towards the back of the bike, which means on the right hand side, the drive side here, it is a left hand thread, which means you're turning it in counterintuitively, really, you're turning it in backwards. And then on the other side, the non drive side, you'll be screwing it in in the normal fashion. Now we get a bottom bracket tool just to make sure that the screws are all the way in and tightened up. And just as a little tip, I always prefer to put the main barrel of the bottom bracket in first because the left side, the non-drive side, almost acts as like a locking nut once the main barrel is in. So once you get the right side in and tightened up, you can then put the left hand side in and really lock it down. And that is one fully installed bottom bracket. Right, so the next thing to go on is the brand new square taper style crank set. Now I always like to put a little bit of grease on the spindles of the bottom bracket and that just helps to stop any galvanic corrosion. And effectively what that is is where you have metal on metal over a long period of time. Uh, the two pieces of metal effectively fuse together. So if you ever wanted to take the crank set off again, it would become really difficult by putting a little bit of grease on the spindle that just gives a little bit of separation between the two bits of metal and it allows the crank set to come off a little bit easier if you ever need to. And a little bit of grease on the screw that holds the crank on as well doesn't go amiss. So there we go, that's the crank set fitted and that spins beautifully. I'm really impressed with that bottom bracket. I feel like I've struck gold there. Right, we're getting to the business end now and I'm about to put the rear derailleur on and I've just noticed that uh, the cages on the two derailleurs are very different. The newer one that I'm putting on is a slightly longer cage compared to the smaller cage on the old one. Now, that is because the cassette on the new wheel that I'm gonna be using is an 11 to 30, whereas the old one is an 11 to 28. Now those two teeth may not make too much difference, but having the larger cage will help accommodate the slightly larger cassette for those extra teeth. And now that's on, I'm just gonna offer up the new wheel uh, to make sure that it all fits properly. Now the new wheel that I'm using doesn't yet have a tire or inner tube in it, but I just wanna offer it up just to make sure it fits before I go too much further. Right, well after a bit of a fight, the wheel went on. Uh, it was a bit of a struggle because it seems as though the rear triangle, although I measured it uh, and it seemed to be exactly right, it's just about one or two millimeters too narrow. Uh, so I had a bit of a fight just pulling the, the rear triangle uh, apart here to get the wheel up in, but that's absolutely fine. I've gone ahead and put the tires and the inner tubes uh, on the wheels. So I'm gonna get those pumped up in a moment and put on, and then I'm gonna put the seat post on and then start working on the cabling. Right, we're really motoring now and it's time to put the shifters on and I've bought these micro shift drop shifters. Uh, I've actually got these on my Triban 500 SE and I also put the cheap Chinese variant, which I believe are called Micro New uh, from AliExpress. I put those on my last gravel build that I bought and they work absolutely perfectly. A lot of people really down talk micro shift, but I really like them. So I decided to go for them on this build as well. And I'm really looking forward to getting these on. Right now these shifters are really easy to fit. Um, there is obviously a left and a right because one side will do the front derailleur, the other side will do the rear derailleur. You know with these particular ones, which is which, because the left hand side for the front derailleur has triple written on it. Now these are really simple to fit. Uh, all you have to do is pull the hood back over the assembly and you will notice that there is a 
uh, a hex nut just inside that tightens and loosens this locking ring. So then all you do is slide the ring onto the bar, get it to the position you want it in, and then use your hex head Allen key down the side just to tighten it up and tighten it into position. So I've taken the bike off the stand for now because I actually find putting the shifters on is a lot easier if the bike is flat on the floor as it would be when you're gonna ride it. Now, the first thing I notice uh, as I put this down is that the bars are actually slightly rotated upwards. Uh, I put them on very gently when it was up in the stand knowing that I'd probably have to play around with them and indeed they are too high. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo these pinch bolts and then once they're undone, I can align the handlebars making sure that they're right in the middle. That looks pretty good. And then make sure that the drops are flat to the ground and that looks pretty good. Now, when you're doing these pinch bolts back up, don't do each one as tight as it will go and then move on to the next one. You need to do them half a turn each at a time. That then means you've got even pressure across all of these pinch bolts and you won't end up with this faceplate slightly skewed. So just half, and then when it gets tighter, quarter of a turn. And then what you want to do is get your torque wrench and torque it up to the proper measurement. And for this one, it's six Newton meters. So I'm just gonna grab my torque wrench. So set it to six Newton meters. And then again, don't do it immediately up to six Newton meters. If it's still turning, just do each one quarter of a turn and then move on to the next one. And keep doing that until you finally hear the click from the torque wrench to say that it's at the correct measurement. There you go, that's that one. And that one makes four. And I'm happy that they all clicked one after the other because that means that they're all being done up at exactly the same pressure and so there won't be any undue stress on this front plate. Okay, so now I've got the bars nice and straight. I can lift the shifters up and tighten these into place. And how I usually work this is by running the bottom of the brake lever in line with the underside of the drops. That usually works out pretty well for me. There we go, and I would say that that is pretty perfect. Now just to repeat the process on the other side. Right, there we are, the shifters are on. So now I can put it back in the stand and we can start running some cables. Actually, now I've just got it back up in the stand, it would probably be prudent to put the brakes back on before I run the cable, so let's do that next. Okay, that is the brakes back on, uh, but I'm actually now going to run the uh, shift cable in first because that's what comes out the sides of the shifter here, whereas the brakes go through uh, the back of the shifter and they run along the handlebar for a little way. So I'm going to put the shift cable in first and for that I've bought some absolutely stunning cable housing. Look at that turquoise, beautiful matching, absolutely love it. Now if you were to buy the official Jaguar version of this, the official name for it on the Jaguar website is uh, Bianchi Celeste. I think Celeste, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and it is very, very expensive. However, I hunted high and low, and eventually I found this stuff on eBay. I had to get it from France. And so similarly to my last build where I bought the brown cable housing, that was quite expensive because brown, it seems, is only used on retro builds, uh, whereas this was actually a lot cheaper than the last stuff that I bought. And it was a lot cheaper than the Jaguar Celeste stuff as well. Uh, so yeah, really, really pleased with the color of this because this is gonna match in perfectly. So let's get the shift cables in. So actually the first thing I'm going to do is make a nice clean cut on the end of this cable because it's been cut at a bit of an angle. So I'm going to use these Park Tool uh, cable housing cutters and cable cutters which are really good because they give a nice clean cut and they don't pinch the cable housing at all depressing the, the inner liner so it protects that inner liner which is pretty good. But still as I mentioned in my last build video I have a set of uh, little files that I use just to round out the edges of the cable housing, just to make sure that the cable can slide through nice and easily and that there's no uh, restriction there whatsoever. So once the ferrule's in, I can slide it into the side of the shifter there and then I just need to work out how much uh, cable housing that I need. So I don't want it too short uh, so that when I turn the handlebars, the cable starts to pull, but I also don't want too much that it kind of protrudes too far out the front and looks silly. Yeah, I reckon that will probably do us. So I will cut that there. Right, so the next thing to do is run the shifter cable through, uh, just to make sure that this cable housing doesn't keep popping out. And handily, you get all the cables you need with the micro shift shifters, which is quite nice. So we've got two shift cables here 
and they are different lengths and we are doing the rear derailleur at the moment so of course we'll take the longest one because that's got the longest way to run and then we feed the cable through and it should hopefully there we go pop out of the bottom there and make sure that's fully seated now you need to make sure that the cable is rooted through the cable routing guide under the bottom bracket so make sure it passes through there fully and then there's another cable stop at the end here so run it through that and then I'll run a small piece of cable housing bent up at the end here that goes right into the rear derailleur. So now that that one's done, we can move on to the front derailleur. And it's exactly the same process. Right, so that's the front derailleur cable in. And again, I'm just gonna pinch that up hand tight. Uh, I'm not going to do it fully yet or cut the cable because I still need to uh, index the gears to make sure that they move in and out properly. So now that that's done, I can move on to the brakes and they simply slide through the back of the shifter and come out down the side of the hood and run along uh, underneath the bar tape on the handlebars. Now the right brake, which in the UK we use as the rear brake, will run along the top of the top tube here, uh, cabled in, and then the front brake will simply have a probably only about 20 centimetres or so of cable housing to go into the front brake caliper here. So again, we've got two brake cables here and we're gonna go for the longer one as we're doing the rear brake, first of all. So now that the cable's through, we just have to work out uh, the length of cable housing we need. And once again, I'm just going to give a clean snip to the end of this cable just to make sure that uh, there are no obstructions. And then we put a ferrule on and feed the cable through. Now this cable, as I say, goes around the handlebar underneath the bar tape. So once I've got this cable housing in, generally what I'll do is run some electrical insulation tape to hold the cable housing against the handlebar. That way, when you come to do the bar tape, you don't have to worry about holding up the cable housing while trying to get the bar tape around, which becomes a bit of a pain. So as I mentioned earlier, on this one, the cable housing runs all the way along the top tube here. Again, you wanna leave a little bit of slack at the front so that it doesn't pinch when you're turning, but you don't wanna leave too much so that it looks silly coming out the front of the bike. So we will cut it about there. Now, pro tip, and I have made this mistake myself many times, is the leaving the cable inside the cable housing when you cut it, you then end up cutting the cable inside and your cable is too short. So just make sure that when you cut your cable housing, you pull the cable out completely first and don't make that mistake. Okay, so once that's cut, you can re-thread all your cable through the cable housing, but make sure that you put it on the right way because I've put that over the handlebars and not under it. So we'll pull it back out and then we do it again the right way. Make sure you don't get it around any of the other cable housings. Post that in to the back of the shifter and then into the caliper. And then once again, I will just tighten that up slightly. So finally now, just to do the front brake and we do the same thing again. And that is nearly a fully built bike. All the brakes and shifting is done now. The only thing really left to do is to put the bar tape on and the pedals and then just do some fettling with the brakes and the indexing of the gears. So as I mentioned in my last gravel bike build, I absolutely detest doing bar tape. Uh, so I'm gonna leave that till last. Uh, so I'm gonna now fettle with uh, the indexing. I'm gonna put the chain on to be able to do that. And then once I've done the indexing of the front and rear derailleurs, I'll then work on the brakes and then finally get onto the bar tape. Okay, so now we're at the point where we need to size the chain. And ordinarily I would have done this from the old chain, but as we have a slightly larger cage derailleur on this now, uh, that will mean that the, the chain needs to be lengthened slightly. So the best way to do this when you're doing it from scratch, when you don't have an old chain to go from, is to use the big ring to big ring method. Now the important thing to note is that we've completely bypassed the derailleur up here so far. So all we've literally done is run the chain around the biggest cog on the cassette and the biggest ring on the crank at the front. So the first thing you want to do is add the quick link uh, to the chain if you're using one. And then once you've worked out the link where your chain meets up, you want to add two more rollers. So this is our link here. So then we add one, two more rollers, and this will be the point where we want to cut the chain. And to cut the chain, we simply get our chain tool, place the link in that we want to cut, tighten it down, and then remove the pin. Remove the chain and don't forget to remove the little pin. And now that's cut, we can run it through the derailleur. And then once it's through the derailleur, we add the other half of our chain link, pull the two ends together 
and attach. And there we have one completed chain. Right, so now the chain's on, all that's left to do is uh, fettle with the indexing of the gears a little bit. It's not too far off, I've just had a quick play with it and it doesn't need too much work. Um, but I am no means an expert in indexing gears, so I'm not going to give any tuition on that whatsoever. Um, there are plenty of videos online like Park Tools or even RJ the Bike Guy that will teach you infinitely better than I can how to index gears. So I'm not going to do any part of the video on that, I'm just going to get on with that and just try and mess around with it myself. And then once I've done that and I've sorted out the brakes, final job is the bar tape. Right, well it took a lot longer than expected uh, because, as I say, I am no expert in indexing gears, but the gears are now all working absolutely perfectly. And it was the front derailleur that was really causing me issues and I had to play around with the high-low limit screws quite a bit. Uh, release the tension on the cable, retighten the tension on the cable, but anyway, I eventually got it done and we are now finally ready to do the bar tape. Now, as I mentioned in my last build video, I like to use a method that Calvin Jones on the Park Tools YouTube uh, account uses, which is to use electrical insulation tape backwards effectively so you have the sticky side facing out. You wrap that really tightly around the bars all the way up to the point where you want the bar tape to finish and then when you run the bar tape around it adds an extra sticky layer. That helps if you ever come off the bike and the bar tape cuts, it stops the rest of the bar tape unraveling and coming off so you still have a handlebar that has a modicum of bar tape on it. So as I said before, I absolutely hate wrapping bars but this is the best method I've found so far and I've had no problems with my bar tape previously using this method. Before I started using this, uh, I would just wrap the bar tape using the self-adhesive uh, strip on the back of the tape and where I was gripping on, I clearly didn't pull it tight enough because I was ending up with all sorts of gaps on the bar tape and it just looked awful. So, as I say, this method is the best one I've found so far, so it's what I'm sticking with. Right, that is the insulation tape on and very sticky it is too. So the final thing to do is to put this awesome turquoise bar tape on that I found from uh, Data. Now again, I'm no good at wrapping bars, so I'm not gonna give any instruction whatsoever on this. So we'll probably just end up time-lapsing through this bit. But let's get the bar tape on nonetheless. Well that is the dreaded bar tape on uh, and the only thing left to do now is to put the pedals on and I'm using these double sided flat and SPD combination pedals because Jimmy currently rides with SPD SL road cleats and doesn't have a set of SPD uh, gravel or mountain bike shoes so I decided to put the flats uh, with SPD on there so he can ride them both with flat trainers but also when he does transition to uh, a pair of mountain bike or gravel shoes he's got the SPD there ready to go. Right pedals are on and I've just realised two things I need to do. One is give it a good rub over with some GT85 because there may be some of that cure rust uh, still left on the frame and then we need to weigh it. Right she is clean and sparkling and glossy as the day she came off the production line so the only thing left to do now is give her a weigh. Um, I'm already a bit concerned about this because Having lifted it on and off this stand a couple of times during this build, I'm concerned that she is a bit of a weighty girl. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, she's a heavy one. So let's get the scales out. Okay, moment of truth. Front wheel off the ground. Yep, yeah, as expected, 13.4 uh, kilos. So it is uh, just under a kilo lighter than my last gravel bike build, which I made from the Pinnacle Lithium 2 bike. But that bike is uh, largely aluminium with just a steel fork. So the fact that this is all steel and only a kilo heavier is actually testament to what a great frame it is. Despite the fact that it is an extreme budget bike, uh, it's actually 
pretty good. And I am very, very impressed with how it looks. So one final, final thing I've just remembered that I need to do is to go through the costs. Now, again, as I did with my last gravel bike build, I'm gonna get my phone out to have a look at this here because there are quite a number of costs and I don't wanna miss anything out. Okay, so starting with the very first thing that I changed, the bottom bracket adapter to change it from an American style uh, BMX BB to a more common BSA style. That was 16 pound 50 from Amazon. The cable housings and cables came to 20 quid in total. Now, if I were to have gone for the Jaguar Bianchi Celeste color, they were 20 25 pounds for the shift cable and 27 pounds for the brake cables. So that would have been over 50 quid just for the cables. But thankfully I found these ones on eBay and it was only 20 quid. So very, very happy with that. The handlebar then came from Planet X and that was during one of their flash sales. And I got that for a fiver, which again is an incredible price. Uh, it's a Selkoff Sterato flared gravel bar, 42 centimeters wide. The bar tape is Dada Elementi and it is sea foam green. And I got that from eBay, $7.99 that was. Now the shifters, uh, as I say, I went for the genuine micro shift variant, which came in at $49.99. Now, if I'd have gone for the Chinese version, they were 12 pounds cheaper, but I would have had to wait a month for them to arrive. So I decided to bite the bullet, went for the genuine micro shift ones over the micro new ones. But again, I'm more than happy to swallow that cost uh, just to be able to get them here in time and get this built. The stem was seven pounds from eBay. That's a buck loss stem. The quill to A head adapter was 4.99. That was from eBay. The saddle was $9.99 from AliExpress. The pedals and cleats were $17.99, and again, they were from Planet X. Uh, the crank set was $12.99 from eBay. And again from eBay, finally, the chain for $8.65. Now, if I've done all of my sums correctly, that comes to a grand total of 161 pounds and nine pence, which I think is an absolutely fantastic price for a fully built, fully functional gravel bike. Now, as I said at the top of the video, I wanted to try and keep this under 150 quid, and I would have done had I gone for the micro new shifters over the micro shift ones. But as I say, I was happy to bite the bullet on that, take the extra cost purely to get it here so I could get this built quickly and not have to wait around. So yeah, 161 pounds and nine pence was the total cost and I just think it looks absolutely incredible. And so there's only one thing left to do now and that is to present this to Jimmy. But that is gonna happen in another video. So for this video, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.